to quote a great philosopher, which ties into our topic for the day, I've got the need, the need for speed. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Mac, joined by my co-host, Kristen, and you're listening to another episode of the M&K Productions podcast. How are you doing today, Kristen? Everything good. Uh, yes, we are, are, we're back. Uh, this is our first episode since the Doctor Strange one that we released almost uh, two, three weeks ago. Yeah, that. that was a while ago. First, I thought it was like, wait, is it Nicolas Cage? And I was like, no, it can't be. And I was like, oh, wait, Doctor Strange. <laughs> but it was it was a good episode. We talked a lot about our issues with that. And But yes, this, this episode, it's a heavy-hearted episode, a.k.a. a goodbye episode. So to fill you in on the lore, your host, one of your hosts, Mac, and me, when my voice cracked. This will be the last episode I'm on for a while. I am taking a hiatus. A hiatus from this Asus laptop because I'm getting a new laptop. I was like, laptop. Confused, I was like this. <laughs> Yes, um, this is, will be the last episode that I will be recording on my uh, Asus Chromebook. Uh, as you, many of you have known that I've been looking to expand the podcast and to probably get better quality production so i don't i hate the watermark on one to share i've been using one to share for almost like a couple like almost all these three years now damn but thank but well, luckily with some help from my trusty host Kristen, i have been convinced to get a macbook so it will be here within uh the next time you see me so look out for more live streams more better quality edited videos and possibly a couple video podcasts where we show our face. Wouldn't that be cool, Kristen? They can see our face and judge us. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> do they really want to judge us? I mean, they're judging us now how we talk, so. And if uh, you do judge us, uh, faces, you judge us by our faces, you're a douchebag. But anyway, oh on this episode, this is episode 79, by the way, we will be going over some entertainment news because, damn, there is a lot of juicy stuff that's going on, both sad and compelling at the same time. And then today's topic, we will be going over in honor of the release, recent release of Top Gun Maverick. We will be reviewing the classic 80s film, Top Gun, with everyone's fi- favorite Scientologist, Tom Cruise. And then we will be getting into the box office reports and the M&K upfront, what we have coming up for the next couple episodes. So, Kristen, are you ready to go? Let's get going, Mac. All right, let's get right into the news. Yeah. This is CNN. All right, so the news for this episode. Kristen, you said you wanted to kick us off with some news. Give me some news. All right. What should we talk about? Casting news or um, movie news? Like titles, movie titles. What do you want to – you pick. Well, I feel like you, this is kind of the one – if we're thinking of the same movie, I feel like that – this There's is the two, I have two different ones we could talk about, depending on which one it is. Let's talk about casting. Okay, casting news. Here we go. Nicole Kidman, Zac Efron, and Joey King are set to star in a new I comedy for Netflix. And this is coming from Deadline. Netflix has set an all-star ensemble for a new untitled rom-com. As sources tell Deadline, Nicole Kidman, Zac Efron, Joey King are set to star in the pick with Behind the Camel... Candelabra writer Richard Lagravis directing, and he grew up the squip, 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 squip. <laughs> he up the squip. Okay. Anyways, the story is set to follow a surprising romance, which kicks off comic consequences for a young woman and her mother. Which I'm guessing the young woman is going to be Joey King, and her mother, played by Nicole Kidman, and her movie star boss. I'm thinking maybe Zac Efron, if that's the case, as they face complications of love, sex, and identity. The film was recently greenlight and will shoot later this year. Oh my gosh, if this involves love, sex, and identity, do you imagine if like Zac Efron falls in love with Joey King and Nicole Kidman at the same time? Oh my gosh. I'm just scared about Joey King's return to Netflix since her Academy Award winning uh, film... The kissing, the kissing booth. Yeah. And then did you see her also recent features? All I know is that she's in bullet train, so I have not seen anything. Um well Joey King has like a pretty strong summer coming up. She is gonna be starring in the bullet train with 
um, Brad Pitt, which is like one of the top films. I cannot wait to see this summer. And then she was recently also in another film called In Between, which is available on Paramount, but that was released earlier this year. And then she's going to be starring in a Hulu film called Princess. I believe that's what it's called. I'm going to just double check. Oh, it's called The Princess. Excuse me. Yeah, you got to remember the thought part. <laughs> the, the. Okay. And then, yeah. So this is going to be interesting, I think. Are you what? also a Nicole Kinman fan? I don't know if we talked about that. I, we said this when we talked about I Love Lucy. I think she's a good actress. Oh, yeah, that's and, right. She's a, Yes, that's right. She's a good actress, but like. She needs to learn how to say no. She does. And then this is also the kind of like a reunited project collaboration between um, Zac Efron and Nicole because they both starred in a movie called The Paperboy. I think I remember that. Yeah, it was like released like in 20, like 12, I believe, if my sources are correct. But uh, yeah, 2012. Yeah, and it had, like, John Cusack. I remember Matthew McConaughey being in it and, uh, like, Nicole Kidman and Zac Efron. I did watch this because it was, like, one of the movies, like, I watched when I first got Hulu because I was like, oh, my God, I got to watch this scandalous Zac Efron oh movie because I'm old enough now and I don't remember a single thing about it. You loser. Yeah, and I was just like, well, I like Zac Efron. I, I will bet you 20 bucks that this movie – that they're doing now is going to be number one trending on Netflix for like a week. I, I, oh, I guarantee that. I, I because it has bet is on the bet is it has, on. It has star power and it's a comedy. You know, like people are like it's a rom com. Yeah, so that's going to be number one because it's like the stuff you see trending on the Netflix top ten that really puts in perspective what people watch on Netflix and I'm like, damn. This and they is just want they know how to set up a page to be like, hey, this is the recent one, Zac Efron, hey. And people love Zac Efron. I mean, that Down to Earth show was one of the hottest shows released in 2020. And he did that good movie this year, Gold. And we did love Gold, yes, which did. was the Zac Efron movie that he did. And then, however, I did see Firestarter. And, uh, it was a fire shit, if you know what I mean. Yeah, did you, so, did you see it? I finally watched it a couple weeks, like last week, and it was... It was bad. It was, it was like I did, not, I did not get what they were trying to do. And it felt short. So I'm glad my dad was like, yeah, I told him I saw it. And he's like, I don't it felt like it was like what it felt was it less than 90 minutes? Yeah. And I said, Thank God that I didn't go to the theater to pay for this because oh, I only paid I I convinced myself I was like, let's try that parent not paramount peacock again. And I got the peacock to pay four ninety nine to watch it. And man, you must really feel really feel stupid. No, I don't feel. Here's the thing. <laughs> I am happy I watched it because I laughed the entire time. My sister and I had a great time and watching it. We ate our popcorn and like my sister's not for one to watch horror movies. She likes certain horror movies. And this one she wanted to watch because it looked ridiculous. And she's like, I want to watch it because of Zac Efron. I was like, great. This is why we're sisters. Oh wait, I and, think you told me you told me that she was. You said she did like horror movies. She, she was just. You guys were just laughing. So I was like, wow. Yeah, we laughed the entire time. We laughed at the liar, liar, pants on fire scene. We loved that part. Every everything in it, from the, the unfortunate bad performance of the girl that was in the film. Let's face it. Following up, oh, Drew Barrymore had to be a very. Uh, and then just everything in that film, just that whole vault. We were just like talking to each other how a lot of things in that film did not make sense, especially the characters' decisions. And uh, yeah, uh, Zach Efron will definitely step up his game, hopefully, here. Oh, did you see now? If you follow Zach Efron on uh, Instagram, he is now the face of uh, a pancake. I didn't see that. It's like the Kobe Jack mm-hmm. Kodak. Jack, Kodak, Black, Jack, pancakes. Oh Colby I Jacks. I, Colby Jacks pancakes. And I've eaten those too. Those are really good. I just can't pronounce it right now. Oh my God. I, I've eaten them before Zach Efron was the face of them. <laughs> oh my God. Your turn, Mac. <laughs> um, so, my new story is that, Kristen, I, I know you, 
you mentioned your your partner, your boyfriend, is an anime fan. Have you ever seen One Punch Man? No, but he he does enjoy One Punch Man. So Sony Pictures is getting Fast and Furious Seven director Justin Lin to direct One Punch Man, the live action movie with Scott Rosenberg and Jeff Pink- Pinker to script. This is coming after Justin Lin a few like a month ago left it he exited the Fast X after a parent blow up with Vin Diesel. So what a what a project to get under your belt. You leave one big franchise to start a new one. Now here's the thing. If he left the Fast and Furious movies, he knows he's gonna have to step up his A game to show Vin Diesel what he can do. He's I would like be alive. Yeah, I would love to see that. And even if the film isn't that good, maybe I will just go to be like, hey, Vin Diesel, words matter to a degree. <laughs> or like, stop trying to think you're all serious, dude. Like, we get it, but no. He's I crude. That's like all he says. Justin Lin will be making One Punch Man in a spite. He's letting all of his anger out and passion. As we but do. but that leads to a question, Kristen. Out of these three, I was talking to my coworker today at work about this, and 2008 was the year of the live-action anime adaptation films. I keep saying, is it adaptation or adaptation? Adaptation. I, that's adaptation. how I say it. Okay, so out of these three movies, which one do you like the most? Dragon Ball Evolution, Street Fighter The Legend of Chun-Li, or Speed Racer? Hmm. Okay, so you said... Um... Dragon Ball, the tw- 20... 2008, all these, all sorry. came out in 2008. 2008, and then uh, Speed Racer, and then what was the other one? Street Fighter, The Legend of Chun-Li. I haven't seen Street Fighter. No one has, it's okay. And I don't think I've ever... I don't remember if I ever watched that, the 2008 version. I don't remember. I might have, but... If out of everything though, I'll just say Street uh, Speed Racer. Good. I almost said Street Fighter. What the heck? Speed uh, Racer is the best one. So it honestly, like thinking about it, it is. Even though it's not that great, I know how much you love it though. Cause it's like people are like, oh, it's too wacky and stupid. I'm like, did you not watch Speed Racer back in the day? That's literally what it was. Like, yeah, it actually, it's perfect. And I think it's the Wachowski's best film since The Matrix. Cause Love Kata was sucks. Yeah, it's a lot of the others. Wachowski sisters films aren't that good mm-hmm. in recent memory, but um uh yeah, I guess I would have to go with Speed Racer. Yeah, I'll just I call, call it that. Speed I call it Speed Racist. Oh god. <laughs> Alright, what's your next news story? Alright. I feel like we're gonna go with this news, so you can change your mind because I know you said you also had a title reveal. Oh no, I was just I I don't have a title reveal. I was just curious to see if it was the same one we were I was thinking of. Oh, okay. Well, the one I was going to talk about because of the recent episode, well, previous episode we did of Nicolas Cage and one of the the film mentioning one of the greatest films of all time, Paddington 2. Uh-huh. Paddington 3 is happening. That's not the Joker. No, it's not the Joker, <laughs> but I'm sure we'll talk about that next. Because I think <laughs> you were going to talk about that. Oh, I was talking about that. But yeah, Joker 2 got announced, by the way. That's, that's the, but yeah, Paddington Yeah, with 3. Lady Gaga, with a musical. I'm going to watch oh, it. Right. I'm Paddington excited. 3. Paddington 3, yes. That's the one we care about. No, we both. I care about both Joker two and. Paddington um, three is gonna be in Peru, and I cannot wait. Well, math just took out the words out of my mouth. It's gonna be directed by Doug Doug Wilson. But anyways, Joker two is happening. No, no, no. We're not gonna go over Paddington. Paddington is the great, like legitimately, like no joke. I do love the Paddington films. They're so. Funny. I do too. So if this comes out and it's like. Because doesn't Paddington 2, does, isn't it perfect? Wasn't it perfect on Rotten Tomatoes? It was perfect. Like, literally, how is that? Like, that means there's nothing wrong with these films. I love the first two films. I don't know. I guess it's just so beloved and it's just so family-oriented. Did you see the video that they made of Queen Elizabeth and Paddington? That was Marvel? really cute. I'm not going to lie. It was cute. It was so dorky, but it was really cute. 
What did you think of that? I thought it was cute, too. I was like, because Paddington is so wholesome. It's like, he's like the bear version of Keanu Reeves. He is. He's just so huggable and just so, he doesn't, the thing is with the character of Paddington, he has nothing to say bad. And that could be just, even like Winnie the Pooh. Mm -hmm. Like, that's a character, like, maybe any bear character that's like, Winnie the Pooh and Paddington, they'll never say anything bad. They just want to give you a bear hug. No no pun intended. <laughs> but I, I can't wait for it. Like, I'm, I'm definitely going to see it. But yeah, Joker 2 also. It's What's the title of it? Uh, the Paddington movie? No, Joker. Uh, Joker? I, I, I've been calling it Joker 2. Yeah, and... it's like something like Felix de la Lacacus or something. Yeah, something. I think it's like something French. Yeah, but. And there's people are saying though about the Joker too that <laughs> Lady Gaga could be Harley Quinn. And everyone would burn the theater down. No, I would be really excited. For no it. one wants watch, that. Watch her sing her heart out if she is like Harley Quinn. She might be. She could be, if that's the case, the greatest Harley Quinn of all time. Them fighting could, words. And could defeat Margot Robbie's character as the most notable Joker at the not Joker Harley Quinn at the moment. Warner Brothers could say, "Hey, what what have we been doing all this time with Margot Robbie? We should have had Lady Gaga." So I'm very excited. Wilson, the director I said earlier, joins the franchise following the exit of director Paul King, who mount, who mounted the both past installments to huge success and is now focused on the Timothy Chal- Chalamet film Wonka. Oh, so yeah. he's got no time because he's got to worry about the uh, tro- Jimmy Chalamet and his chocolate factory. <laughs> that sounds so weird, but okay. But actually, my next news story does involve Warner Brothers. It's my last one. Have you been keeping up with The Flash? Oh, God. I mean, absolutely, because at this point, because stupid Ezra. Oh, Ox isn't allowed. Has to. Okay. So, back in our Morbius episode, uh, when we had Glam, Glam Geek Guru on, uh, we did mention a news story about how Flash actor Ezra Miller was uh, alleged to have uh, assaulted their... Uh, friends or whoever they're saying with in Hawaii saying, I will bury you in your slut wife. So, you know, class act character there. But um, recently, uh, since, since then, there's been a flurry of just more stuff coming out. Recently, uh, allegations of grooming when they met a, uh, I'm going to say it's a girl, but they do go by they and them, so it gets them to that point. The, the parents of the victim say that Ezra met them at the Alaskan Pipeline protests and the victim they said was 12 and is now 18 and the victim has come out saying like that's not true that's not lying that's lying and apparently when the courts are trying to serve papers to Ezra Miller for these allegations they can't find him they can't find them like both of them the victim and Ezra and this has led to like a big shit show of Warner Brothers, people calling out Warner Brothers, like, you need to do something. Like, it's to the point where Warner Brothers have not even said, acknowledged it at all. And it's to the point, like, what's what's going on? It's, this is the point not, I think also now, where this not just involves Warner Brothers, this involves police. The police. And then, not just that, Ezra's manager, his agent, his publicist, Everyone around him, is, I mean, them, excuse me, is involved. Yes. And I don't know if nobody is doing anything. I'm sure Ezra's team has to figure out something and is trying to tr- at least track some form of Ezra down. Because at this point, if they're missing... God only knows what could happen. I mean, I, they're, po- they're posting on social media like they're all fine. That's the thing. Yeah, which is really dumb. And I, I believe Ezra at this point is also choosing to dodge his the manager and agent and everybody. If I, if that was my client, 
I would have gotten rid of Ezra Miller in a heartbeat. And that's just me. Yeah, I know. There's just that, like I said on the Morbius episode, there has been just a sequence like all the way ranging back from 2011 with them. So it's like it's been escalating since then. And I don't know if there's something psychologically wrong or just there's some very bad issues that they need to get work, worked out. And I think that's what needs to happen at this point. I mean, what do you think is best for, I think, Warner Brothers and for Ezra's team? What do you think? Here's the thing. It's a damned if you do, damned if you won't situation because – Here's what you can do. You can either A, fire them, then let the police do what they have to do, but then firing them allows them to bring in Grant Gustin as the Flash, but you're already finished the film, and apparently with test screenings, the film is doing great. So you have to reshoot everything, probably rewrite some stuff, you had, um, everything, pretty much, probably maybe set the movie back, because it seems like with The Flash and Black Adam, they're, they want these to two, be the two big movies of the new era of DC, and then... But the other thing is, do you just release the movie? The, there's the other hand. You release the movie and just pray to God that they get their shit together before the movie comes out. That's literally because if you you release it and you'll just take the loss. Yeah, I think that's what they're thinking. I think the Warner Brothers has their hands full also given what been going on with the case of Amber Heard and Johnny Depp and more millions of other people saying you got to – Get rid of Amber Heard. Um, this is also another case. And I think here's an idea. If Warner Brothers is still up in the air about not knowing what to do in the case of Ezra, I wonder if they can pull a thing where it's like a similar situation. What happened uh, with the Crystalia and Army of the Dead Oh yeah, they situation. just they just did CGI Grant they Gustin's head on. CGI'd everything around Tignataro. Oh God, that's that would be terrible. Remember, I mean, is it the best solution? No, but uh, you got some people boycotting Warner Brothers in the film already. So I'm not. I know one or two people wouldn't make a difference, but it just shows how many people that they're not going to want to put up with it if it becomes more of a head and the situation. So it does not look good. I mean, the worst case scenario. They push it back and reshoot. They have to push it back and reshoot. And they either have to cut down significantly on the film and maybe cut some scenes around it. So that way they can either find a new replacement and build the scenes off of the character yeah, because it's like I said, it's just like they have a lot of money writing on this. This is like one of their, this is one of the only projects that was announced from that initial Batman v Superman phase that yeah. like, they they will they were still like on board for. And here's the thing: if they let Black Adam go and they release it, fine. And what they they should probably do is take what money they ever get from that Black Adam and put it towards the Flash. They're definitely going to have to, but I don't know. It's just a very bad situation all around. It's a very messy situation. And remind me the director of The Flash again. The director, damn, I forgot because it was supposed to, it actually, originally, Zumbling. it was supposed to be uh, Phil Lord and Chris Miller, but then I think yeah. they became... Then they became writers. And I think they were producers. But it's Andres Mushiti. Mushiti. Who did the It movies. Well, I have a... I like the first It. The second It, I don't... I'm I don't also like going to say this. The director of the uh, Flash movie also dated Amber Heard. Oh! At one point. So this all goes back to Warner Brothers. <laughs> so this director has worked with Ezra and now Amber Heard, who are now in this whole shakeup. And I just love the fact the director was just even in the essence of all this. He also did Mama. Yeah, to be honest, looking at his filmography, he doesn't really have a lot. But I'm seeing and I'm not digging it because, well, I like Mama. I like it, but not it, Chapter 2. And I don't know about the Flash movie, but... 
I am seeing he's doing a live action Attack on Titan movie. He is. Oh boy. And I just remember seeing like you, but you know, if you feel that you don't want to watch The Flash because of Ezra Miller, you know, you you are entitled not to. If you think Warner Brothers isn't like doing enough stuff, you know, that's yours too. But you can always you can see the movie too. And have you can give zero shits about what we have to say because this is just our opinion. But I will still be watching the Flash movie. Um, I will just know that I just need to just watch the movie, just not pay attention to the actor. But it's just such a shame because there's a talent that is a talented actor right there, but just very self destructive. Yeah, it's in an unfortunate, a very, very, very messy situation on Warner, Bro- Warner Brothers' hands. Yeah, Warner Brothers needs to, uh, how do you say, uh, fix their shit or get their shit together. Yeah, because been... I think they, I think they just got a new executive too, and he's apparently going to report he's been cleaning the house. No. Let's move on to the topic in which is actually better than some of these films these people have been in. 1986's Top Gun. This weekend, Paramount Pictures invites you to take off. I feel the need. With Top Gun. First speed. Woo! Rock and roll. Top Gun. Rated PG. All right. So in honor of Top Gun Maverick coming out and pretty much being the, people say the consensus best movie of the year, which is like, holy crap. Like, my God. I, I, I knew Top Gun Maverick was going to be good, but I didn't think it was going to be like, I haven't seen it yet, but I, from what I've seen from like it's news, it's amazing. I never like I'm shocked. So good on you, Tom Cruise. You can still make a great action movie after damn near 30 years or 40 years since the original one. But today we're talking about the original 1986 Top Gun movie with Tom Cruise, Kelly McGillis, Val Kilmer, Anthony Edwards, and Tom Skerritt. Sker- it is produced by the legendary Jerry Bruckheimer and um, directed by. Tony, Tony Scott. Scott, thank you. The plot of it is um, it follows Lieutenant Pete Maverick, played by Cruz, a young naval aviator aboard the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise. He and his radar intercept officer, uh, Nick Goose Bradshaw, played by Edwards, are given the chance to train at the U.S. Navy Spider Weapons School at Naval Air Station Miramar in San Diego, California. And, um, yeah, if you ever seen Top Gun, what the hell is wrong with you? This is... Like, when you hear quintessential 80s movies that have stood the test of time, Top Gun's always on that. Because something that was made in 1986, for me, feels so timeless. It's a staple of the 80s. I wasn't around during the time it was released. I was born... We both were, no. I was born, like, 10 years after that movie was released. So 13 years after, baby, the 90s. Yeah, we are both 90s babies. But this so, movie's so good. T- Top Gun is an excellent film, and it's unlike what it was released during the 80s, especially with all the action sequences and the cinematography and how everything was captured. It's amazing. Like, no wonder people like it from not just the performances and the direction from Tony Scott, but from the... Aerial shots of what they were able to get is quite amazing. And if I'm not mistaken, they actually did film in fighter jets, right? They put like a camera in the cockpit. Mm-hmm. Cockpit. That's yeah, impressive. They That's... And they got like training. They give, like I said, the training from um, flying the planes, and uh, they used several aircrafts. They it says on here on the Wikipedia page the Navy made several aircrafts from the F-14 fighter squadron, so the F. VF-51 Screaming Eagles. That's awesome. And, uh, for, and then it just talks, and then you can go on. They Like how many like different sorts of aircrafts they used. But um, it's quite amazing. Yes. What, what they, how they did everything. And I think it's a legacy film. Oh, yes, most certainly. That's definitely and, a- As I was say, um, it's a, it's been like even restored in like a... Th- IMAX 3D release because I was re- I'm reading over it now. It says on the Wikipedia page, uh, Top Gun was re-released in IMAX 3D on February 8, 2013, just a year later, for six days. Format preview for a conversion for featuring Danger Zone flight sequence was screened at the 2012 International Broadcasting Convention in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. So I feel like that's kind of cool. Like I know that the recent film. Is like I got to see an IMAX, but we'll talk about that next episode. Mm-hmm. 
But like getting to see that in 3D is pretty awesome. I feel I like, like that's I feel, what you see in 3D. I feel like the Top Gun movies are definitely like you have to see in 3D. That's like the one movie I'll be like, I'm not even a 3D fan, but I'll be like, I no. need 3D. So I know. Uh, what was the last 3D movie you saw in theaters? Multiverse of Madness, and it gave me a headache. I uh, the last time I saw a 3D movie. I didn't even know 3D was. A I thing don't something. even like go to see 3D movies anymore. Uh, the last time was Star Trek Beyond because if I can. Oh if I can, my god, that's old. Holy shit. All right, I think it was like Star Trek Beyond. Yep, was it was Beyond. It was 2016. Oh my god, what the hell? Yeah, I was. I've been able to dodge them. Like I was well, like, okay. The funny thing with 3D is like I dead ass thought it went out of style with like after Age of Ultron. I thought like, cause I saw Avengers in 3D. No, before Doctor Strange, the last 3D movie I saw was uh, Infinity War. Okay, uh, I didn't see Infinity War in 3D. I saw that in an IMAX setting. I saw it in 3D in the front row because it was the last seat, so I had a head. Oh, damn. That's yeah, the worst. That's, that's what I didn't even, like I said, I thought 3D was like a thing of the past, but no, we, this Top Gun came out in 3D, and I'm pretty sure the new Avatar is going to be 3D. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy is right. And then everything from, I know it got mixed reviews from it, but it's funny how it just gained popularity and just kind of has that good sense of review, but. Uh, who do you have first of all a character you prefer in the Top Gun movies? Like I'm now, gonna... do you prefer Go- Maverick or Goose? Maverick. Oh yeah, of course Maverick. Maverick is played by of course Tom Cruise. His character is loosely based off on Duke Cunningham and his accomplishments during the Vietnam War. That's and... pretty cool. I would not mind how Tom Cruise be loosely based on me in a movie. It's amazing how he looks like there because, like, even now, I don't know what kind of water he drinks at the Scientology Center, but it makes him look very young, along with that Botox he gets. They they drink the blood of the youth. Tony Scott, let's, we'll talk about Tony Scott for a little bit before we talk more about the casting, but Tony Scott is a director who's directed Beverly Hills Cops, Days of Thunder, The Last Boy Scout. The Last Boy Scout, True Romance, Crimson Tide, Enemy of State, Man on Fire, Deja Vu, and the last movie he directed was Unstoppable because in 2012, that was the year, uh, unfortunately, he took his life. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, and I felt, I was really sad because like it was like two days after my birthday and then I heard the director of Top Gun died. I was really, really devastated. Because oh, so I grew up with Top Gun. Oh, I was so like, he- no! He definitely had a smile on his face when he was watching this. This was like one of his Top Gun was his baby. And I think if he was around, he would have stayed on longer for to even direct the new one, if to be honest. Mm-hmm. And I love the direction that he took with it. And I love the themes that this film easily expresses, especially about family and um, trauma and loyalty and bravery and all that stuff. Yeah. And I think out of all the characters in this film, I think the most developed, though, in this film is definitely um, Maverick. Because over the two years, like, I was like, I thought all the characters were great. And not all of them are really well developed. I think some of them are kind of one note. Uh-huh. I mean, don't you agree? I mean, what do you think about them? Uh, a little bit, because to be honest with you, I didn't really like Kelly McGillis at all. I just know, was it, if I'm not mistaken, does Jennifer Connelly replace her in the new movie? Mm-hmm. And I thought, I think, I didn't see it, but I like Jennifer Connelly, Connelly more. And then, I don't, re- like, Kelly McGillis doesn't really do much acting, I don't think, really anymore. I don't remember her seeing it at her in anything recent, if I'm not mistaken. Not me neither. I didn't even know who she was. I forgot who she was. No, she hasn't really, really done a whole lot of stuff and like the last thing i think i actually like the last screen presence she did was in a hallmark tv film in 2017 <laughs> oh, no, that sucks i mean uh, not sucks for a bank account but you know that damn yeah she hasn't she hasn't done much in a long 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 time but uh 
who knows maybe she just realizes that acting wasn't for her maybe i don't know but uh her character uh, is based on the real life person Christine Fox who worked at the Naval Air Space Station um uh, Mamara M- Mamare yeah whatever but uh yeah I think that was cool and oh my gosh Christine Fox looks like Mc- uh the real person looks like reminds me of uh Kelly McGillis oh good for her but can we talk about the best character in the movie Iceman who is yes, pop- Iceman I- one of the best movie antagonists like Maybe of all time. He's one of the best ones. I'm not going to lie. He is really, really enticing, I think. He's just so macho boy, mean jerk football player kind of school, even though he's not, like, I'm just, you know, stereotypical. But it works. He works. And I love his hair in this film. I love the blonde that he rocks in this film. This was Val Kilmer, like, when he was, like, in breaking out, but it's sad what happened. I don't know. I know the story of Val Kilmer is like very sad, but yeah. I, but I did, I did know, I do know what happens in New Top Gun, so I'm kind of glad he got that because he got the throat cancer. He really can't, he can't really do a lot anymore. No, he can't, he can't do much of talking really anymore. Unfortunately, he, that's why he hasn't been in a lot of stuff either. Um, because I think the last thing he was before the New Top Gun, he was in like the Snowman. He was actually in a movie called The Birthday Cake, really? which I did see, which was released almost about a year ago. He played like a mob king, like the mob lord, like an Italian mobster. Crime boss, yeah. Crime boss. And I was just like, he tries his best. And I think they put like little like words over it and they put like a little ascot like over his thing to show well, like. like if like they tried, like I get it, but it wasn't that good. But. At that point, I would have just had him as the quiet mob boss, so he doesn't have to talk. And just work with his hands. Yeah, like you can be a hand. Like back. he didn't have to talk, but no, but I don't know. It's just like, um, Iceman. <laughs> like is I get it. The... He wants to act, but if you want to go back and watch Val Kimmer, this is the one film you have to watch. This is like one of his defining films. It is, besides like the Batman stuff he did, but oh my gosh, he is. He is so, so masculine in this role. It's great. And every every single guy in this film is, like, filled with testosterone, though. Because it's the 80s, baby. The 80s, baby. And that soundtrack. Let me oh, tell you about that soundtrack. Yes. Highway the Danger Zone. Zone. Actually, I have a fun fact about baby. What's your fun fact? So, me being a gamer, you know, pro gamer move, uh, GTA 5 has a great soundtrack. And one of the songs is Danger Zone. And actually, there is a heist you play as. You do a setup mission where you're stealing these Hydra fighter jets. And when you're taking off in the mission, when you're taking off from the naval, when you're stealing the jet from the uh, naval base, it starts playing, like, the opening verse to Danger Zone. It plays throughout the entire mission. There's also another game that does that. Which one? Um... Oh my god, my boyfriend's gonna kill me. Now I'm gonna like brutal the game name. But it's the one where the soccer ball and uh the cars Rocket League. Rocket League, thank you. Oh, hey, folks, I'm a gamer. And <laughs> <laughs> wait, they do that in a Rocket League? They play uh playing with the boys. Oh like, god. but it's a cover song of it. It's well, not did- does Rocket League have Kenny Loggins as a? No, they does not have that, the original Kenny Loggins. No. I know they can get out of here if it's not no, the original Kenny Loggins. It's not great. No, here's another thing with GTA. They actually have G- Kenny Loggins as a host of a uh, nonstop pop um, or um, Ro- uh, Los Santos Rock Radio. He's the host. That's sweet. That's so awesome. Like, and he's I he's like playing Danger Zone by Kenny Loggins. It is like it's self aware. It's so awesome. That's awesome. He does have a new book coming out. I will probably read it. I am a Kenny Loggins fan. I will say, like, but this soundtrack is, there's a reason why it's a uh, nine-time platinum certification. Because it's, like, it's one of the most, um, probably one of the most listened to film soundtracks, like, all time. It's, like, one of the pivotal ones because it's, like, any kind of 80 soundtracks that sticks up there. But for me, this is, like, one of the top ones. Like, this is a soundtrack you can just play over and over and over again with each song and just have a great time with each song. And it's just, like, takes me back to, like, the scientific vacation when James Gunn tries to plan out his film soundtracks. Like, I feel like he looks to films like Top Gun to 
inspire him with their soundtrack. Because like Top Gun and Scarface, they did it. They were like the pioneers of this. Exactly. And fun fact, most people believe that uh, Danger Zone was a the Academy Award winning song for a Top Gun, but it's not. It is Take My Breath Away. Really? Yes. Uh, Take My Breath Away by Berlin won the Oscar and the Golden Globe. Damn, that is some freaking... But that that slow motion, take my breath away, and that romance between Tom Cruise and Kelly McGillis, Mm. I'm telling you, that's some sexy sexy stuff right there. Oh my gosh. I'm not gonna lie, that they they have some nice romance, they have a nice little romance with that song, and I think it's cute. I'm not gonna lie. But yeah, Top Gun is a great movie. Definitely like, I don't know, it's just something about 80s movies just hit so much different. And that's, I think that's what I was, well, we'll talk about it next week more with Top Gun 2. But that's what I was scared when they were making a sequel to Top Gun. It's like, they're going to make um, Tom Cruise's character like weak and like getting outsmarted by his newer cult. But no, he, he remains a cocky son of a bitch he was in the original one. Mm-hmm. And I thought, and- I don't know, it's just like, it gives that air of confidence that you want, that you want to become a fighter pilot. Yeah, and there's a lot of inspiration for that, and to at least get people, especially young audiences, get inspired by, like, at least an idea of joining the Navy, even though it's not all hyped up to be. It's very serious. People take their job very, very seriously there, as you should, and... But if you want to blast some Kenny Loggins, it's okay. Yeah, if you want to blast some Kenny Loggins, it's fine. But, uh, yeah, it's all fun and games. It's... Uh, one of the big films that Jerry Bruckheimer has produced because the man is a solid gold of the 80s. Oh my he God. Produced, 80s and 90s. He produced American Gigolo, yep. Defiance, yep. Flashdance, yes. Beverly Hills Cop, Beverly yes. Hills Cop 2, and then 90s, Days of Thunder, Bad Boys. Dangerous Minds, The Rock, Con Air, Armageddon, Enemy Estate, and then just he and then he also expands into the TV universe. I mean, at one point in his career, he did uh, produce Kangaroo Jack, but uh, we'll, hey, we'll hey, talk hey, about that. Oh, listen, it's to the hip, the hop, the hip, the hip, 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 quintessential like 80s 90s guy was like any any action movie from those times he had his name in it he was the original jason blum Mm -hmm. he pretty much is and like you i can kind of even see that jason blum because like like even i'm even going through his filmography now he hasn't done much of horror except deliver us from evil yeah which was that eric banna movie from like 2014 who? Eric Bana. Who? And, uh, Edgar Rod- Ramirez. Remember that film? And I think Joel McHale might have been in it. Yep. Oh, is that the guy who played the Hulk in 2003? Man, what's he doing nowadays? Joel McHale? No. It, damn it, you ruined the joke. <laughs> it's talking about Eric Bana, damn it. Eric, oh no, Eric Bana. I was like, who, which one, like, who, which one are you referring to? I was like, yeah, so you lost. Ruined, you ruined the joke. But yeah, I don't yes, know where Eric yes. is. It was just that guy. Didn't he play in that movie where they casted Mark Ruffalo in, though? Yeah, I forgot that Eric Bana was also Hulk. Going back to Top Gun. Uh, <laughs> bless you. Going back to Love Interest, do you remember who Goose's wife was? No, actually. Who was it? Meg Ryan. What? Meg Ryan is Goose's wife in the movie. Oh, my God. And... I was saying to myself, holy shit, that's a like really young, like, Meg Ryan. I, so like... Was Because she didn't do SNL until the 90s, right? No, she didn't do, like, she didn't do, like, When Harry Met Sally until, like, 1989. So this was, like, one of her first... Oh, one of her first roles, damn. Like, yeah. Yeah, because uh, I'm even rereading her stuff now, too. She did, like, Amityville 3D in 83 and then rich and famous in 81 so this is like one of her first baby roles oh wow so so she is a legend in the top gun world 
So um, just wanted to put that out there. And she's really cute in the film. I love her as Goose's wife. I'm not going to lie. She has, I know, like, Kelly McGill is, like, you know, is supposed to be, like, really serious with her role. Because, you know, she's the teacher. Mm Mm-hmm. In the film, like teacher soon such a situation with Tom Tom Cruise and everything, but there is something about where I um you know Goose and Meg Ryan it just works and yeah. Anthony Edwards I love the two of them they they don't have there's not much chemistry time because uh no no spoiler alert but uh Goose dies yeah and, knows all, that. and Anthony Edwards is only in the film for like an hour and four minutes to be exact so um. Just the time that he gets to share with, you know, Meg Ryan and his son, he because Goose does have a son in the film. It's really, really cute. And I just, like, love seeing them all sing Great Balls of Fire. I just love that scene. <laughs> like, a lot of the singing moments hit in this film, especially when Tom Cruise sings to Kelly in the film. Oh, my God. I love that scene. You got that. Uh, I did like the great balls. Lost that love and feeling. And then do you know what? What? Um, There is Scream 2 actually mentions a top top gun in the film. Do you remember when Jerry O'Connell gets up on the table and sings to Nev Campbell? Yeah. That and um, that is a little like top gun moment. Oh my gosh. Like, you know, that song is not mentioned, but they mentioned Top Gun. And I just was like, oh my God, this takes me back to even screen too. So I just wanted to say that too. <laughs> but uh, what would you rank Top Gun? What's your rating of it? Oh, I rate Top Gun as like something that has been long, film that's very close to my heart and what it is. I give this film like a nine out of 10, like maybe even 8.5 out of 10. Honestly, it's the same rating with me. I, I'm mirroring I this. just, like, enjoy it. It's just great. It's just fun. It's entertaining. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, is that all we have to say about Top Gun? It is. Yeah, so watch Top Gun, the original. If you've seen the new one, let us know. If, you, if you've if watched the original one, let us know in the comments what you think of it. Did you like the first one or the second one more? You know? And just as a reminder, we will be talking about Top Gun Maverick next time. And Jurassic World Dominion. Yeah, which we'll be talking about right now. Oh, wait, what? Which one are we talking about? The Op Friends. Oh, yeah. So let's move on to the Fox <laughs> and then we get up front. Uh, quickly, transition. All right, so to wrap up this very chaotic episode of the podcast, because we are both half tired, we were just having the fun just recording for the first time in a couple weeks. So it's been fun. But we're going to be starting off with the box office report for this past weekend of June uh, 10th to the 12th. So at number 10, we have An- Annie Suntaniki. Ran- Ranky, yeah. $620,000. Number 9, Sonic the Hedgehog with $750,000. Eight, number 8 is Firestarter, which jumped from 21 to 8. What the hell? $833,000. Number 7, Everything Everywhere All at Once at $1.3 million. Number 6 is Downton Abbey, A New Era, $1.7 million. Number 5 is Bob's Burgers, The Movie, $2.4 million. Number 4 is Bad Guys, $2.5 million. Uh, number 3 is Doctor Strange, The Multiverse of Madness, with $5.2 million. Top Gun Maverick comes in at number 2 with $51.8 million. And Jurassic World Dominion comes in with the cool $145 million at the box office. I'm shocked about... Fire starter, how it went a full 13 spaces up from 21 to 8. Yeah, I don't know what's happening with that fire starter. Well, I guess the kids are out of school and they want to see a soft horror movie, apparently. I was not th- thinking of what you were going to say. Oh, no, that's I'm just thinking because it's like they want to see a soft horror movie because isn't it PG 13? Yeah. It, oh, yeah. Uh, no, that, that, those ticket sales are definitely for the kids from like, middle and high school. They, they're not old enough to go to a rated R movie. Yeah, they uh, are not old enough to do that. So. Uh, but Jurassic World Dominion with 145 million, Jesus. You know, I said 30 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't have much to say about the recent box office stuff because we'll talk about it next week. Not not next week, but whenever we record the Maverick episode. But uh, all right, so we will talk next time more about the Top Gun Maverick box office along with all of our uh 
upfront schedule let's ha- to see what's happening next episode it's going to be our summer special kick off the summer season with me and mac and we're going to talk talk on maverick because it's like one of the hottest movies like we said and we also just recorded and what you listen to our yep. top gun review and we're also going to talk some jurassic world dominion maybe we'll have a guest on i don't know and then we're also going to review a brand new film that was sent to us uh, details will be that will be coming up about that soon. We're also going to be doing a Thor uh, Love and Thunder review once that hits. So that'll be coming out in July along with a Jordan Peele retrospective because yep. lo- of the upcoming release of Nope. Nope. So, yeah. So, uh, Mac and I, we're going to dive into the world of Jordan Peele. And that's what we have on the M&K Rep front, along with some potential interviews and more some fun surprises along the way. So, uh, yeah. so be on the lookout. So keep up with our Instagram page, the M&K Productions podcast. will be linked in the description and the M&K Productions TikTok page, so you can follow us on those two sites. But until next time, I have been Mac. This has been Christian, and you've been listening to the M&K Productions podcast. Bye. Bye.